Hello and welcome to the Hush Blackwell Labor Law Insider Podcast. I'm Tom Godar, your host, and I'm glad that you've come along. In this podcast, we welcome guests with practical expertise and experience regarding labor law issues, and they share their insights related to this ever-changing area. The breadth of developments in laws related to unions and individual workers' rights that we are experiencing under the Biden-appointed National Labor Relations Board and led by General Counsel Jennifer Abruzzo is unprecedented. These developments demand that employers and those giving counsel to organizations stay tuned into these changes and make necessary adjustments to their practices and policies. When President Biden was elected, he promised to have the most union-friendly administration ever, and he is fulfilling that pledge. So buckle up and hang on for this wild and wonderful ride in the world of labor law. Welcome once again to the Labor Law Insider. It is great to have you here, and uh, we really appreciate you joining us. We have a fabulous panel, and we're going to talk about something that really gets to the heart of the matter. What happens if? And the what happens if, there's a remedy. If an employer is found to have committed an unfair labor practice or even accused of it, and now they're looking at how they're going to resolve it, maybe through negotiation, or if the unions have started down a process towards an election, maybe even had an election, maybe even a law held an election, and see what kind of remedies the board is offering if they believe that during the course of the election process, maybe an unfair labor practice occurred. And I said we have a really terrific panel. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, but these are three colleagues from across the country. We have Megan McManus, whose first time appearance on the Labor Law Insiders today, and welcome, Megan. I'm going to have Tricia uh, Moore talk a little bit. She's been a frequent guest and a terrific guest over time. She's joining us once again. And Terry Potter, a stalwart and a veteran of Labor Law Insider podcast, and also one of the editors of our Labor Law Insider blog. They're all joining us today. But before I extol your virtues, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Megan, why don't we start with you as the newbie? Oh, thank you, Tom. I'm so happy to be here on your podcast. Thank you for for having me. I am a traditional labor attorney, have been my entire career. And before I became a lawyer, I was an HR manager. And sort of interestingly, I was management for a labor union, which is quite an interesting sort of spot to be in, particularly when um, some of our staff, employees of that labor union, um, sought to organize and management (laughs) for the labor union's employees who were seeking to organize. That was actually my first organizing campaign. And um, during that... Uh, Did the union oppose that campaign at all? They just say, come on, we'd love to have a union representing our employees. Suffice it to say, they did not say, come on, welcome. (laughs) Not surprising. But it was a tricky needle to thread, a tricky balancing act. Let's just say, you know, what what we talked about in the closed, you know, office, HR office, and what we sort of communicated to, you know, the employees, it it was a delicate balance, to say the very least. Um, So I guess I'll sort of leave it at that. But it's um, so. So, yes, I, I knew straight away I wanted to be a labor attorney and majority of my career in New York City and then have had the wonderful opportunity to move back to my hometown in Arkansas because of the link at Hush Blackwell. And I'm so happy to be in this part of the country where there are almost no um, labor attorneys, yet there's a lot of organizing activity here in the South where there hasn't been for a generation. And so I think it's a good spot to be in right now. So happy to be at Hush and so happy to be here in Arkansas. Megan, you might have been the first attorney that uh, graduated from Rutgers coming from the University of the Ozarks. I love that uh, background. Welcome aboard. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Trisha, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, good afternoon, Trisha Moore. I have been with Hush for coming up on a year and a half now. Prior to that time, similar to Megan, I had a non-attorney but legal career. 
I worked for the National Labor Relations Board as an investigator um, for a number of years and then decided, I think I'm going to try this law school thing. Can I stay here? Or are they going to kick me out? And here I am. i um, been working as an attorney since 2015, but in this space of labor law and labor relations since 2000. I am based out of Kansas City, but I represent clients throughout the nation, and I love what I do. I don't consider this work. It's lots of fun. You've never worked a day in your life when you love what you do. It's great to have you, Tricia, and it's true that Meg and Tricia and Terry are our next guests to introduce himself. Practice all over the country, although they are associated with certain geographies. Terry's talking to us today from St. Louis. Tell us about yourself, Terry. Yes, home of the St. Louis Cardinals who are still struggling this year, but I hope return back to their old form. Yeah, um, I, I've been in St. Louis now for over 40 years. I started my career out with the National Labor Relations Board here in St. Louis as a field attorney, and then went on into private practice and have been in private practice ever since then. And I've enjoyed every day of, you know, no question about it. I distinctly remember in law school having a labor law class and going, Ah, oh, finally, something I can dig my teeth into, you know, and that was kind of the turning point for me. But, uh, yeah, I really enjoy this stuff. And we have a good group here at Hush. It keeps getting bigger and bigger. And so it, it's a good time to be part of this farm, that's for sure. Well, and it's a good time to be the host of the Labor Law Insider with three such terrific experts uh, with me. And as I said, uh, when we started out, we're going to talk about remedies. What really happens when things go bump in the night or maybe during the day? And we've seen some changes um, manifest themselves in recent decisions and in, of course, the general counsel memos that Ms. Abruzzo has offered. And in those memos, she anticipated that the breadth of remedies would be much greater than they had been before. And that she was just not satisfied that the unions or their members or those who were seeking to unionize were receiving a fair shake. Now, we can disagree with that. We think that maybe from my perspective, they've gone overboard. But one of the most recent additions of this change in how to look at remedies was described in a Thrive case, which also recently had a court of appeals take a look at the breadth of the remedies. Megan, maybe you could kick us off. Give us a little bit of background to the the Thrive case, the kinds of remedies that the board sought and were awarded, and uh, which were now subject to a review by the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. Sure, Tom. So in, in Thrive, um, just really quickly about what happened. You had an employer. They had a group of sales reps who were you know, represented in this particular unit, bargaining for a successor agreement. Negotiations were not going well, reached impasse, employer imposed last best final offer, and a union actually filed a ULP over that, and the GC did not prosecute that charge, actually said that the impasse was lawfully declared, and that last best final offer was appropriate. So then about, you know, sometime later, the employer communicated to the union that they needed to lay off some employees. Business wasn't great. They need to lay off some of those sales reps and they were going to do so pursuant to that last best final offer. And part of that last best final offer had terms in it that provided for the opportunity for the union to discuss the effects of, of that layoff. The union waited some time before they talked to the employer. There were some meetings. There wasn't any progress made. Employer kept saying, you know, we're going to continue with these layoffs. At the time that this 30 days, you know, notice period ends, the employer did, in fact, lay off these sales reps. ULP comes about from the union and ALJ says that it was not unlawful. The ALJ agrees, right? But the, then the board finds that, that the layoff was unlawful. And not only was it unlawful, the board made clear that those remedies, in quotes, all direct and foreseeable pecuniary harm that resulted from those employees getting laid off should be 
awarded as part of the make whole remedy to these laid off people. The board and Thrive did not go into what exactly the remedies should be. That's for compliance and and to actually sort that out. And there needs to be evidence shown of exactly what pecuniary harm was direct or foreseeable. But the board said, yes, we agree what the GC is asking for should be standard part of the make whole remedy. So the employer appealed the board's decision to the Fifth Circuit. The Fifth Circuit said the board was wrong when they said the employer violated the act when it laid off those employers pursuant to its last best final offer. The Fifth Circuit said that it was perfectly lawful. That declaration of impasse was lawful. The impasse was not broken just because they were talking about the layoffs and the employer followed all the terms in the last best final offer when it implemented the layoffs. Therefore, the layoffs were lawful and the impasse was existed. And so no violation there. But then what about the remedies? They did. They they said that they, they had a little, they, they jabbed, they called them draconian for one. And they called them consequential damages, which the board and Thrive was very, you know, careful to say these are not consequential damages. These direct or foreseeable pecuniary harms are not consequential damages. They were careful to say that. The Fifth Circuit said, mm, nah, it sounds like consequential damages to us. But the practical reality is, even if the Fifth Circuit had said, No, you don't have the authority. The act doesn't give you the authority to issue these remedies. Draconian, I believe they said. These draconian. Yes, draconian. (laughs) These draconian remedies. I don't know, like, right? The board board is going to go forward anyway, right? Yeah, and that's, I've, I've loved in my career remedies portions of cases. But when they get into this level of questions, this becomes itself a trial that could take longer than the trial on the merits. What is a credit card debt? How much did you have to pay extra for a home loan that you wouldn't because your credit was damaged and suddenly you're paying 9% rather than 8% or 7% interest on and on it goes. It's a lot of fun for lawyers, but it's no fun for clients and it's certainly not fun for the tribunal. Terry, in your long career, uh, both as a labor lawyer and as well as going back to the time you were with the board, did you see this kind of movement towards this kind of consequential, I think, damages? No, this whole process as we're viewing right now is nonsense to sum it up. You know, there is a procedure that's been in place for years uh, with the NLRB. You have a question of liability initially established, and we have compliance proceedings. And there is an abbreviated process for both of those because these are administrative proceedings and therefore in the hope that the employees would get their remedy sooner versus later. That was a trade-off. You know, and and in part of that also is the fact that there are certain due process elements like discovery that don't take place as part of the liability portion of those proceedings. If we're gonna open up the door to these expanded remedies, then you gotta open up the door to discovery. Otherwise, you're just lacking due process on behalf of whoever's the defendant uh, in these proceedings. So you got to redo everything. And that's not what Congress said we were supposed to be doing, fundamentally. You know, you go back and read the legislative history. All this is nonsense because that's what we were trying to avoid. And now this GC wants to ignore all that and say, ah, uh, I'm going to wordsmith this. These are not consequential damages, blah, blah, blah. And it's just, it's embarrassing. And the Court of Appeals slap them down almost every time because they don't know what the hell they're talking about. (laughs) But how do you really feel about it, Terry? No, (laughs) you know, and and it's more than that. Our clients, even when they settle cases uh, with the board, normally they're asked to do a posting saying that they've settled a case. There may or may not be exculpatory language. Oftentimes the board tries very hard to have none that says, well, I'm doing this even though I don't think we, or we don't think we violated anything. 
But now it's gone beyond that, where the board is seeking, even in terms of settling these cases, letters of apologies and letters that don't just get posted in the middle of, you know, a bunch of time cards and other things, but they're sent to each person's house. And guess what? Then you just push forward and they're sent to the press and everybody else in the world. You know, Tricia, you've had some experience with some of these other remedies beyond even what Megan mentioned. What have, what have you been seeing out there in the real world of uh, National Labor Relations Board practice? Well, first and foremost, I'm not surprised by anything that we've seen. <laughs> and that, that's unfortunate to say. But one thing I do appreciate about Jennifer is she's honest and she tells us what she's going to do. And when she became GC, I think it was, I mean, really just weeks after she became GC, I don't know, her second or third GC memo, seeking full remedies. She laid it out. Uh, I think it's 2106. And then a couple days later, she issued another one. <laughs> so she has been true to her word about what she is going to do. And this is dramatically different from what I experienced when I was at the region. So for our listeners, I left in 2014. So my experience would be prior to that time. And during my time there, starting in 2000, it was normal for us to settle a case and get 80% back pay. You would never see that today. I would never even mention that to a client because you aren't going to obtain back pay of anything less than 100%. That's just how it's going to be. I never heard of credit card payments or paying rent or utilities or, or mortgages, um, you know, unreimbursed fees for gas costs to get to finding a, a new job, resume writing fees. It's the board focuses on what they call make whole remedies. And I was taught that it is to put the person back in the position that they were in, if not for the alleged discriminatory behavior. And so when we think about that, I mean, really, it could be, hey, I normally worked at home, but now I don't, and my house flooded. But if I would have been at home, I would have been able to catch that. I mean, that's very extensive, right? I'm, I'm making that up. But I don't think that it's unrealistic when we look at the list of not only uh, supposals, but actually, I mean, there are cases out there. We have years and years of cases now where we can pinpoint and say, yes, in this case, this is what they found. And in Jennifer's most recent, maybe it's not most recent, but a recent uh, GC memo, GC 2404, the second paragraph is a list, like half a page list of all of the remedies she is going after. And without reading those to you, I just mentioned some of them. I mean, daycare costs. Your kid didn't have to go in daycare before. Now they're in daycare. I mean, if you can prove that this is a fee that you had related to the alleged unlawful behavior and you no longer being employed, you're going to be able to ask for it. So my guess is they might be uh, hiring actuaries or, or someone who's working in data science who can really crunch these numbers. Tricia, thank you so much for those insights. Uh, they're really helpful. And uh, at the same time, I think we're going to push a pause button. I want to continue this conversation with you and Terry and uh, Megan. But let's push a pause button. We're going to get back to Terry um, when we come back in a week or two with more talk about how these remedies um, are going to affect uh, employers and the entire board process. But we also have some suggestions, maybe not solutions, but at least opportunities to ameliorate some of the havoc that this extensive uh, review of remedies under General Counsel Abruzzo is causing. So thank you very much for joining us uh, for the Labor Law Insider today. And thank you, Terry and Megan and Tricia, for sharing your expertise. And we'll be back in a couple of weeks to share a bit more. Have a great day, everyone.